Hello and welcome to part three of our cir circulatory system lecture and in part three we're going to take a look at uh, properties associated with the heart. Uh, I apologize for the rapid end of part two uh, but there's a 15 minute limit uh, on these videos and I was at 14 minutes and 57 seconds and so uh, we need to end it a little bit abruptly. Uh, if we take a look at the properties associated with the heart the first thing we're going to see is that the heart wall is uh, organized very similar to what we have within the blood vessels. So in a blood vessel, the generic wall had the tunica intima as that endothelial lined uh, internal layer up against the lumen. We had a tunica media where we had smooth muscle. And then we had the tunica adventitia around the outside as that connective tissue layer, uh, that support layer. When we take a look at the heart wall structure, we're going to see the same basic thing. But because we're dealing with the heart, we're going to give it different terms. So within the blood vessel, we had the tunica intima, an endothelial lined uh, space along the inside of the, the vessel. In the heart, we have the endocardium, again, lined by an endothelium, a simple squamous uh, epithelium. In a blood vessel wall, we had the tunica media, uh, the layer with the smooth muscle. In the heart, we're going to have the myocardium. In the myocardium and some smooth muscle. In the heart, we're going to have cardiac muscle fibers. And so, uh, again, very parallel to what we saw within uh, the blood vessels. And then outside of the myocardium, outside of the smooth muscle layer, uh, we're going to have the epicardium. The epicardium is going to be the connective tissue layer surrounding the heart. Uh, and that is going to be roughly analogous to what we have with the tunica adventitia of our blood vessel walls. Okay, so if we take a look again at these different layers, uh, the endocardium is going to be the innermost layer. And so if we take a look at this, uh, the lumen, the inside of the heart is going to be towards the hot, is towards the top, it's that kind of grayish layer. We're going to be lined by an endothelium. So again, a simple squamous epithelial lining, giving us a nice smooth surface along the inside of our heart. Uh, it's going to be sitting upon a thin continuous basal lamina or basement membrane, depending on if we're looking at light microscopy or electron microscopy. And then underlying that, we're going to have a subendothelial connective tissue. So we're going to have some elastic fibers, some connective tissue supporting it, and maybe some smooth muscle cells uh, in this area. And then deeper than that, we're going to have the subendocardium. And this is going to be a loose connective tissue. We can find some blood vessels, some nerves in these regions, as well as within the ventricles, we'll find the Purkinje fibers. Uh, the Purkinje fibers are part of the impulse conduction system that allows us to regulate the contraction of the heart. The myocardium is going to be the middle layer. And so again, the middle layer is going to be composed of muscle fibers in the heart. These muscle fibers are going to be cardiac muscle fibers. And so very, very thick because the heart is a muscular organ, such as is, is working as a pump in our closed circulatory system. So we need very forceful, very controlled contractions, which are going to be pumping the blood all the way out through all of the arteries, through the capillaries, and still with enough pressure to bring it back through the veins to the heart so that we can recirculate it again. Now, it's important to keep in mind, like we had with a larger blood vessels, we need to have additional vessels coming in to support uh, the survival of the cells within the wall, in this case, within the wall of the heart. In blood vessels, we had the base of a sorrel. We had vessels within the vessel. When we talk about the heart, what we're going to be looking at are going to be coronary arteries. So coronary arteries are essentially supplying the oxygen and nutrients to the heart, but they're coming in from the outside. So they're branching off of the aorta, essentially turning right back around, and they're going to be delivering oxygen-rich blood to the myocardium. And we're talking about it here because it's essential that our cardiac muscle cells within our myocardium get lots of oxygen, get lots of nutrients, because hopefully your heart is going to continue to pump regularly throughout your entire lifetime. If you disrupt that blood flow, if you have blockage of these blood vessels with a blood clot, which is called a thrombus, or you start to have plaque buildup, fatty deposits for atherosclerosis, you interfere with the delivery of oxygen and nutrients to these cardiac muscle cells. The cardiac muscle cells can become starved for oxygen and nutrients, and in some cases, they can actually die, contributing to uh, a heart attack, in essence. And so it's going to be important that we've got these vessels coming in from the outside, these coronary arteries, roughly analogous to our base of the sorum in our blood vessels. They're going to be delivering oxygen and nutrients 
to the heart, but primarily to our cardiac muscle cells within the myocardium. We take a look at a comparison in the cardiac muscle between the atrium and the ventricles. Uh, what we're going to see is that, uh, in general, we're going to have less abundant connective tissue in the ventricles than we do within uh, the atria. Um, and that, again, because we want to have a very forceful contraction in the ventricles. The ventricles are essentially going to be pumping the blood out very forcefully, very strongly out into the rest of the body. And so we've got to be able to squeeze it out as hard as we can, as fast as we can, and essentially because these cells are, are kind of wrapped around, you know, almost in a helical fashion around the ventricle, when they contract, they essentially squeeze out as much of the blood from the, the lumen of the heart or the ventricles of the heart uh, as much as possible so that we get the maximum amount of blood flow going out into our system with each contraction of the heart. And then outside of the myocardium, we're going to have the epicardium. Uh, the epicardium is going to end in the visceral uh, pericardium as the kind of outermost layer. And so we're going to have in this diagram, on the, the image on the right-hand side, you can see a little bit of the myocardium to the bottom. So you can see the cardiac muscle cells. You can see the connective tissue of the epicardium outside of that. So we've got some fat cells. We've got some connective tissue in there. And then ultimately, it's going to end in a serosa. And so the outer covering the heart is going to be, instead of a tunica adventitia, where we're going to have connective tissue and anchoring our blood vessel into the surrounding areas, we're going to end in a serosa. We're going to end in a simple squamous epithelium, nice smooth surface along that. And again, the thing to keep in mind is you want a smooth surface so that your heart doesn't stick to the surrounding tissues. It doesn't stick to the thoracic cavity. It doesn't stick to uh, the lungs. It's able to essentially pump. It's able to move freely and glide across the other structures within the thoracic cavity. And so that smooth surface of the serosa that would be referred to in some books as a smooth mesothelial surface is a smooth surface. It's a moistened surface so that it reduces the friction, allows the heart to pump free from all of the other structures within the thoracic cavity. If we take a look at how the heart is going to be organized, uh, we've got a cardiac skeleton uh, kind of hard to imagine, but we've got a dense fibrous connective tissue, which forms almost like a scaffold that kind of twists around. Uh, it starts with kind of a ring-like structure, which are going to be where the valves, where you have the openings between the atrium and the ventricles, and the ventricles, and either going out into the pulmonary artery or going out into the aorta. All of these things are organized into this dense fibrous uh, connective tissue scaffold, and this serves as an anchoring site for the cardiac muscle. And so the cardiac muscle is going to attach to this and then wrap around the lumens uh, of the vessels, and wrap around the, the space within the atria or the ventricles. Now these rings are going to serve as the openings, uh, essentially the basis for the openings between the atria and the ventricles, and the ventricles in either the pulmonary artery or the aorta. Uh, and it's also going to serve as the starting point for the cardiac valves. So like we saw with veins, we need valves within the heart to be able to keep the heart, uh, keep the blood in the heart flowing in the proper direction. So prevent the backflow of blood when a vessel, uh, either the atria or the ventricles, uh, start to contract. And then the cardiac skeleton also serves as an insulation between the atria and the ventricles. Uh, so it essentially forms this barrier so that the electrical signals associated with the contraction of the atria is not directly transmitted into the cardiac muscle cells of the ventricle. It has to go through the impulse conduction system and control it uh, in a very specific way so that we can coordinate the uh, maximal filling of the ventricles with the contraction of the ventricles and the pumping of the blood out into the rest of the body. If we take a look at the cardiac valves, they're essentially an extension of the endocardium. And so we're going to have that core, which is going to be a dense connective tissue, almost like a little bit plate, which extends from the cardiac skeleton. Uh, it's going to be a little bit, uh, it's able to move back and forth, but it's going to be covered by endocardium. It's going to be covered by that uh, simple squamous endothelial cell. So again, it has a smooth surface associated with it. Now, if we take a look at it in a little bit more detail, we can see that these cardiac valves are anchored by papillary muscles so that essentially we decrease the risk that the, the, the valve would become damaged when the heart contracts because we've got 
an anchoring point. We've got these papillary muscles so that, in this case, when the ventricles contract, we're also pulling on these valves so that it doesn't have a lot of excess pressure uh, on it. Now, in terms of coordinating the contraction of the heart, we've got an impulse conduction system. And as we said in the muscle layer, uh, I'm sorry, the muscle lecture, cardiac muscle cell is self-excitable. And so it has the ability, because of some special ion channels that are present within it, that it can cause its own stimulation. It can cause itself to contract. And so what we have is the SA node, the sinoatrial node, a specific region in the wall of the atrium, which serves as a pacemaker because it essentially uh, is faster than the other cardiac muscle cells. And so it initiates a signal that's going to spread across the atria and cause the atria to contract. And as it's doing that, that signal is going to go to the AV node, kind of at the uh, cluster of cells uh, at the right side of the interatrial septum. Uh, it's two on this diagram. And it essentially is going to collect that signal, have a little bit of a delay, and then transmit that signal through that cardiac skeleton, that insulation point that we talked about before, into the atrioventricular bundle of his. And then that's going to distribute it all the way down through the bundle branches wrap it around, and then through the Purkinje fibers, carry that signal to the ventricles. And so what we're going to do is the atria are going to contract, the message is going to, the depolarization message, you get to the AV node, it's going to rest for a second in essence, not a full second, but just a, a briefly, and then transmit that signal down through the rest of the impulse conduction system so that it rapidly gets out to the signal, I'm sorry, out to the ventricles, out to the ventricular uh, cardiac muscle cells so that they can contract after the atria have contracted. Now the Purkinje fibers are specialized cardiac muscle cells and in this slide you can see normal cardiac muscle on the left, uh, Purkinje fibers to the right so they're larger cells, uh, they're paler staining because they've got less of the myofilaments um, and they're going to be relatively large because they're going to be involved with the rapid transmission of these ion channels, this electrical impulse uh, very rapidly throughout the ventricles and then deliver it to the cardiac muscle cells of the ventricles to allow for very forceful contraction, coordinate contraction uh, of the, the ventricles of the heart. Now that finishes up uh, our view of the, uh, the heart within the cardiovascular system. Um, in the next mini lecture, part four, we're going to look at uh, potential disease processes associated with the cardiovascular system as well as start to look at the lymphatic circulatory system. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu, and hopefully you come back for part four of this lecture series.